two, one. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is McKaylee. I work at Tattered Cover Bookstore. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you. Thank you for supporting your local business. Thank you for just all of your continued support through over this last year, your continued love that you send us by way of books and mentions and everything. We wouldn't have gotten through the last year without you, uh, let alone the last 50 years, because believe it or not, it's Tattered Cover's 50th anniversary here in 2021, which is a crazy feat for a bookstore. So thank you so much for being a part of our virtual community. Hopefully we'll be able to join one another soon in a communal space as we're known for doing at Tattered, but right now we're just happy to have you as a part of this virtual community. For those of you who don't know, Tattered Cover is a local independent bookstore located in Denver, Colorado, and we have four locations in the Denver metro area, soon to be five as of at the end of the summer, which is very exciting. We have our children's only location opening up at Stanley Marketplace, and one of our other stores is mid-move right now. So we only have three locations open, but you can come and visit those three locations as long as you're wearing your mask over your mouth and your nose, and you can come shop and browse for about 90 minutes or so. But if you're like me, want to stay shopping in your pajamas or you're not in the area, you can always shop online at tatteredcover.com. Also on tatteredcover.com is our upcoming events, which, oh my gosh, guys, we have so many of them. It's very, very exciting and ridiculous. We have Susan Mallory, who's going to be in conversation with Robin Carr later this month. Uh, for all of you romance fans out there and women's fiction fans, we've got so many coming up. You can get on our email newsletters and social media to check out um, all of the latest and greatest upcoming events. And the full list is at tattercover.com slash event. Before we continue, I wanna let you know that closed captioning is enabled for those who might want it or need it. There's a black bar down at the bottom of the screen with a button labeled CC on it. Click that button and closed captioning is enabled if you want it or need it. And now it is my pleasure. You all know I've been on so many of these events, virtual events, you know I'm a romance fan. I am thrilled to have this contemporary romance panel, which I confirmed they haven't been together on a panel yet, which is very, very exciting. We are celebrating uh, three books that we have here. I'm very excited for these. I said I wasn't gonna fangirl and now I have to breathe a little bit. Um, but we have Zeo, Ax Zeo Axel Axelrod, the author of The Girl with Stars in Her Eyes, Farah Heron, who's the author of Accidentally Engaged, Kate McMurray, who's the author of Like Cats and Dogs, and the whole thing tonight is gonna to be moderated by Terry Wilson. So this is a treat for romance readers all around. I'm so very excited for this. So please join me in welcoming Zio, Farah, Katie, uh, Kate, and Terry. Uh, we're gonna have them unmute themselves and we'll change our view here so everybody can see them. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Ah, this is so exciting. Thank you for joining us in this virtual room here, celebrating your amazing books like Cats and Dogs, Accidentally Engaged, and The Girl with Stars in Her Eyes. It's gonna be such a great conversation. I wanna let people know that we will do an audience Q&A um, near the end of the segment. And there's a chat that's next to the screen you're watching us on right now where you can ask your questions. Some of you are already active in it. But Terry, as our wonderful moderator for the evening, take it away. Okie doke. Well, thanks so much for having us here tonight. I'm really excited. Um, Zio, Kate, and Farah, I've been seeing your books everywhere and they're all brand new. So um, this is gonna be a really fun conversation. Um, oh, and my puppy is choosing this moment to chew her squeak toy. <laughs> I'm gonna go get that in a minute. Um, but first, why don't each of you um, tell us about your new book and um, just kind of what, what it's about and what inspired it. Starting, why, why don't you start, Zio? Oh, sure. Um, my book is The Girl with Stars in Her Eyes. I don't know if you can see that. It is the first in a four book series about an all female rock band. So you've got um, rock and roll, you've got um, a second chance love story. There's some found family in here. I like to think of it as sort of a multifaceted love story because my um, main character, Tony, her name is Tony Bennett, which I had a lot of fun with that name. But she is a, amazing. She's a phenomenally talented guitarist, um, but she doesn't believe in the idea of fame. She thinks it's toxic. So she sort of shuns the, the limelight. Um, but, you know, life has a different plan for her. And the one dream that she has, which is to own her own studio, sort of like coincides with the idea of 
joining a band to earn the money to, to do that dream. Um, and the, the person who's managing the band that she ends up joining is her long lost childhood best friend slash guy she was in love with and never told who abandoned her. So there's a lot going on there, but there's there's lots and lots of music because that's the world I come from. Um, and there's, there's lots of uh, kick-ass women doing kick-ass things. So yeah, and it just came out on Tuesday. So it's still brand spanking new. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Okay, I already have a quick question for you before we move sure, on. Sure, sure, sure. So the Lilies, I mean, it seems like that's a real band. Is it? They kind of are. Like, I'm a big fan of verisimilitude. So um, mm -hmm. I am trying to create a reader experience that's very immersive. Mm -hmm. So I'm recording music as the band. The band has its own social media presence. Um, they're on Spotify and Apple Music and all that stuff. So if someone just stumbled upon the Lilies on their own without knowing about the book, they just say, oh, it's a cool band with a song or whatever. They wouldn't that know that it was. That is such a cool concept. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, do. Well, um, Farah, why don't you tell us about your book? Sure. Um, so Accidentally Engaged, sorry, my camera's not great. Uh, it came out in March um, and it's a story of Rena who is uh, kind of in a rut in her life, like most of us probably can relate to. She is in a job she doesn't love. She's unlucky in love, has had 12 ex-boyfriends um, and she uh, is really trying really hard to separate herself from her family. Her parents are very overbearing and very domineering and they don't want her to uh, have the job she, that they want and they want her to uh, live where they want and they want her to marry who they want. Um, so there's been a string of what she calls the good Muslim bachelors that they keep pushing in front of her. But the newest one, they move into the apartment across from her, um, hoping that that uh, the two families will combine. Um, but he is not like all the others. He has the body of Captain America. Um, he's got a British accent and he loves bread as much as she loves to bake bread. So she ends up uh, telling him several times that she has no intention of marrying him, but they become friends. And then they eventually, um, they join, uh, sorry, they enter a, a cooking contest together because she wants to win a scholarship and she needs a partner for it. So he pretends to be her fiance. So they pretend to be engaged, even though their parents want them to get married. And then eventually it gets even more complicated. Um, so I'm really excited. There's a lot of bread in it. There's a lot of, uh, it's very much a rom-com, but it's got a lot of family dynamics and relationships. And like I said, a ton of bread. <laughs> so are you, are you a baker? Do you bake bread? Yeah, I do. Uh, I don't think I could have written a book with that much bread in it unless I love bread that much. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a hobby of mine that I think it's a hobby of everybody's right now. So the timing is great for the pandemic, but it's been a hobby of mine for a long time. Have you come up with any recipes or anything to go with the book? Uh, yeah, actually, there's a bunch of recipes and most of the food other than the bread, most of the food they make is, um, is Indian food. They're both Indian uh, via East Africa, both uh, both characters have family are originally from East Africa. So I, a lot of the recipes in there are stuff that I grew up eating, East African uh, Indian food. So there's actually, I've actually ended up putting a bunch of them up on my blog. So on my blog, there's, uh, if you go to my website, um, if you look under recipes, most of the recipes from the book are there. That is so cool. I love how we're having all the, you know, real world, real world stuff to go with everyone's novels. That's awesome. So um, Kate, why don't you tell us about Like Cats and Dogs? Sure. So uh, Like Cats and Dogs, which I put over my shoulder, uh, is set, it's the first book in a series set at a cat cafe in Brooklyn. And the heroine is the manager of the cafe and she's very um, outgoing and kind of a big dreamer and, um, uh, and a little whimsical. And then there's a clinic next door, a veterinary clinic right next door to the cat cafe. And the hero is the new veterinarian there. And he's just gotten divorced and he's very grumpy. And they immediately get off on the wrong foot uh, and they instantly dislike each other and everything is terrible and they fight like cats and dogs. But then uh, a box of kittens shows up at the cat cafe. So they have to work together to save these kittens and then things kind of get messy and complicated after that. And there's a lot of um, fighting and then making out. <laughs> I love it. Um, I personally think a box of kittens solves everything. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying right? my cat is actually sitting next to me, but uh, is camera shy. So <laughs> I'm saying that even out. as a dog person, because I'm surrounded by dogs. But still, I think <laughs> all we, a box of kittens 
thrown into the uh, thrown into the mix always helps. <laughs> yeah. Okie doke. Well, um, I want, since this is a contemporary romance panel, um, I thought that we could talk, I'm going to put on my glasses for a second. I thought we could talk for a second about how each book is particularly relatable to our contemporary world, since that's kind of what we're talking about in this panel. Um, what parts of your book or your characters will really resonate with readers and their everyday lives? Um, so Kate, why don't we start with you since you went last last time? Sure. Well, I, I uh, so I set the series on a fictional street in Brooklyn, but it's it's based on a real place, like it's based on a real street. And um, I lived in Brooklyn for a while, about 15 years, I think, math. I don't, but uh, so uh, I've gotten to know it really well. And there's this area of downtown Brooklyn that I just think is really cool with lots of little mom and pop shops and like, and I wanted to create a block where I could decide what businesses were on it basically, which is why it's fictional. So I put all these little mom and pop shops in a row and I, I sort of wanted to give the novel uh, like a small town kind of feel, even though it's set in a city, because I feel like in a lot of cities, your neighborhood sort of functions like a small town in a lot of ways. I mean, it's a little different, um, but I, I wanted to sort of give it that neighborhood kind of feel. And I feel like the characters are all sort of, they have their own struggles and are dealing with their own small potatoes kinds of issues. Um, but uh, at the same time, I, I feel like these are characters you might run into in your regular life. Like um, even though cat cafes are not super common, uh, but I based mine on a real one that is in Brooklyn that um, doubles as a cat rescue. So they they bring all the cats that they have in there in the cafe are rescue cats that they try to adopt out. So that's sort of the gimmick of this cat cafe is it's sort of a it's a fancy shelter essentially where they're trying they bring in these cats and then they let them go. And the only permanent cat resident of the cat cafe is named Sadie and I based her on my actual cat. So she has a cameo in the book. Oh. <laughs> uh, and so and so that's all. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of one way in is, and there's a lot of animal stuff in the book too. So if you are an animal lover, there is plenty of cat and some dog related content because uh, Caleb, the hero is a, he's a dog person. So he adopts a dog about halfway through the book too. So if, if you like your, I mean, the other cat series in the books are going to be a bit more cat forward, but there's a little something for cat everyone forward. in the first book. Cat forward. I don't think I've ever heard that. In a <laughs> One of the jokes that when I was working on the series, one of the notes that I kept getting from every editor I worked with was that there should be more cats in the book. So like that for a while, I was just calling the whole series more cats. So, uh, there, there are a lot of cats in the book. And I, I try to, you know, give them silly names. And they and every every character who walks into the cat cafe, who ends up as part of a romantic pairing in the book, ends up adopting a cat at some point. So I'm a little evangelical about getting people to adopt animals. <laughs> well, I've read it and I love all the cats in the book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. But kind of what you were describing, I think as romance authors, um, you know, we've heard the term world building a lot, you know, at mm -hmm. conferences and writing mm -hmm. events and in craft talks. And I think that we, um, at least me, I've always associated it with more like fantasy novels, you know, that kind yeah, of yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, but I know that an editor that a lot of us share at Sourcebooks, um, I've, I heard her speak once and she talked about world building as just like a small town and as a community. And I had never really thought about contemporary romance and our settings in that way before. And that's kind of what you're talking about, how you built a world yeah. and you built a community that was like a small, had a small town feel, but in the context of a larger city. Yeah, world building is one of my things. Like I love doing it as an author. Um, I teach classes about it. Like I'm I'm really like super enthusiastic about it. So like I have I have maps, I have <laughs> diagrams of like where which stores are where. I like I did all this work before I started the series because I really wanted to create a like a place that the reader could feel like they could see and walk through and and visit. And and it's grounded in reality in a way too because if you know Brooklyn, you might recognize places that I described. So I'm sort of situating it. Um, so it's a fictional place that's in a real neighborhood. So there's lots of recognizable stuff around. That's awesome. So, um, so Farah, why don't you answer that question? Do you need me to repeat it about contemporary I, world? 
<laughs> no, the question was about uh, how contemporary readers would relate to the story, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's really funny. Um, one question I've had a lot about this book, and it comes up every time I have an interview or something, is did I write it during the pandemic? Um, because a lot of people have noticed things in the book that are very timely for um, these difficult times we live in. Uh, so no, I did not write it during the pandemic. But I think that uh, for the, the modern world we live in, I mean, obviously the surface level stuff is it's about bread. Um, mm -hmm. And I did not know that writing a book about sourdough bread would end sourdough. Like I was thinking like, nobody's going to read a book about sourdough. This is just a weird <laughs> hobby I have. Nobody Repression. else has Repression. explanation about how, but apparently that wasn't necessary because everybody got into sourdough uh, before the book came out. So that was good. Um, but more than that, I think there's a, there's, so the, the relationship is between um, Rena and her neighbor. And I think that is something that ends up being kind of timely for, for where, where our own little, our own little bubbles become much more important than the people outside of them. Um, also the, there's, there's a kind of a, um, a feeling of, of connecting with people, of longing for connections that may not be as easy or may not be, um, that just seem a little bit out of reach. Um, and I think that's something that we can all kind of relate to, especially when uh, we live in cities where even though you're, um, you're around people all the time, you're just still kind of in your own little bubble as opposed mm -hmm. to um, in, in the outside world. Uh, also, there's a scene in there where she uh, zooms into her work meeting. So that is, is timely. Um, but I think more, more than just during the pandemic, I think uh, stories like mine where uh, it's incredibly diverse. It's set in Toronto, which is one of the most diverse cities in the world. Um, but it's also, it's not about, um, it's not about the diversity. It's not about racism. It's just uh, it's not about tolerance or anything like that. It's just showing people um, from different walks of life, from different races, religions, sexual orientations. They're just people doing people things. Um, and I think that's something that uh, readers really want right now because um, I think we need it. Obviously, we need the stories that examine those social issues as well. But we also need to just see marginalized people experience joy, fall in love, um, have complicated feelings about their families, worry about what to get dressed, what to wear in the morning, all those regular normal things um, that, that marginalized people go through every day. Um, and so I think that's something that uh, modern readers are, are looking for, not just readers who they themselves are marginalized, but everywhere. And I think that's something that's kind of timely for right now. Right. Agreed. I mean, when you keep talking about your book, I mean, it really does sound like you wrote it during the pandemic. And I know you did it. I mean, sourdough is having such a moment right now. Yeah, totally. Zoom meeting, sourdough. Right. And yeah. Zoom and all that kind of stuff. That is so funny. I don't think I'd ever heard of Zoom before the pandemic. But <laughs> okay, Zia, so, yeah, so why, don't, uh, why don't you answer the question about um, the girl with stars and rights? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, it's a big music city, it has been for decades. Um, I wanted to create the world that I grew up in sort of for Tony, where she's surrounded by clubs and studios and musicians and things like that, and invite the reader into that world through her, because it's still kind of new to her too. Like she's, she's, she's been playing in, in this place called the Electric Unicorn. So for me, in the world building situation, um, aside from the band itself, um, I'm also like building out in the process now building out the world that she inhabits or the band inhabits. Um, so, you know, we have, I'm working on logos and stuff for the electric unicorn, which is the bar that they will call home. The, the studio that they play in will have like its own thing. So like readers will get to wander around their universe. Um, and again, and like Kate, mine is set in a real neighborhood in Philadelphia that is going through, it has been going through for some gentrification. Um, which I think is something a lot of readers can, especially from urban areas, can relate to. So your neighborhood goes from being this like blue collar, gritty, you know, pizza shop on the corner place to like vegan cafes and like, you know what I mean? And she's, she's the electric unicorn is sort of this, this like last hold in the middle of all this change, um, which is another reason why she gravitates toward this. But I, I, I wanted readers to invite them into Philadelphia because I love the city but also into the world of music. And in order to do that, I had to create these places. I was thinking, you know, as a fan of a band, what do you want to know about the band? Like we have social media now, so people follow the, the singers, they follow the musicians, they 
follow the label, maybe they follow the clubs, like whatever it is. So I wanted to give as much of that realness, that world building that I could um, to the reader. So hopefully they'll, it'll resonate with them and they'll feel like they're part of the family, the Lily's family. That's awesome. So I wanted to ask y'all again, since we're talking about contemporary romance, um, what are some of your personal favorite contemporary romance tropes? Ooh. I seem to write a lot of um, enemies to lovers and second chance, which are both in this book. <laughs> like, 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 I like throwing tropes in a blender and just seeing what comes out. So you've got childhood sweethearts, you know, there's a betrayal, so they're not enemies, but there's definitely some, some tension and friction there that they have to overcome. Um, yeah, I, I love enemies. So I love the idea of two people who think that they have nothing in common, finding that they have everything in common and, and falling in love from that. You know what I mean? So the, banter. Like, the banter. The banter is always fun. The banter is fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's you get, you get those zingers in there, you know, all that, yeah. all that spark, you know, the thin line between love and hate, you know, blurring that up. I love it. Yeah. So Kate, I mean, I know you have enemies to lovers. In yeah. Your I mean, my, as a reader, my personal favorite are friends to lovers. Um, although I also love a really like bonkers harlequin style kind of over the top like a secret baby or an amnesia plot like bring me all the soap opera tropes i love that kind of stuff <laughs> and uh yeah and i but i um but yeah friends to lovers is my like for real favorite um although none of the books in this series are that now that i think about it <laughs> book, book two is a is a best friend is the best friend sibling and then book three is a um second chance book but i mean because as a writer it's fun to sort of play around with different tropes but yeah <laughs> ara what are some of your favorite tropes in contemporary romance oh so i really like to write um forest confinement where you just can't escape the guy he's right there um my first book had the hero moving into her basement apartment um, and then in this one, they live across the hall. And I, I find I gravitate to those kind of stories because it not only it makes it easier as a writer because you get, can get them on the page at the same time, but I just love, it's kind of like what Zia was saying that somebody, somebody that you wouldn't think that, uh, that you wouldn't think you have anything in common with. And, and as you see them all the time because they're right there and they're unavoidable, you start learning more about them and learning about um, about a connection that they have. And then it also goes back to the fact that I like to write in Toronto, um, which is a, a giant city and it just makes things uh, kind of, it's such a big setting. So I like to kind of make it into smaller mm -hmm. by having the uh, people all right there. Um, other tropes are really, I, I mean, Enemies to Lovers is just way too much fun to write. I write rom-com too. So there's just so many opportunities to write uh, humor into enemies to lovers. But it's funny, this book is, uh, there's a little bit of animosity at the beginning, but it's not really enemies to lovers. And like they strike up a friendship pretty quickly. So that was a little bit more challenging because there's not as much tension to, uh, to kind of feed off of. And the banter has to be a little bit different. Um, so I, do en I did enjoy that as well. And I also really enjoyed um, where they built the friendship. So it's almost like they're, bu they're building two relationships. First, they're building a friendship and then the friendship goes to more as opposed to um, my next book, which is Friends to Lovers, where that friendship is already there and then I can grow on it. Uh, so I really like those tropes. So um, Kate has mentioned that her book is part of a series. So is yours part of a series also? No, um, I am not very, I'm not a very strategic author. So <laughs> I, I will have another, I will have another rom-com out next year. Um, we haven't announced the title. The cover is gorgeous, um, but it is standalone. So I, it doesn't uh, have any overlap with this book. Meanwhile, my last book, which was with a different publisher is a series with this one. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not a very strategic author. I need, I need to sit down in like a workshop on how to build your author brand because I'm not good at it. I just do whatever I want. <laughs> Um, but actually, my next book will be a <laughs> YA, which is completely different from rom-com too. So, so oh, I'm just all over it. <laughs> um, so Zio, yours is part of a series as well, right? Yeah, it is. Um, and this is my first book with source books, um, which is an interesting experience because I was I was completely self-published before then, and all of my other books were written 
in the same universe. So you'll have characters pop up from different books into different books and the readers got a kick out of that. With this, I had to create a whole separate universe. <laughs> so I was like, man, you guys are making me work. But I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot going on here, but yeah, it's a, it's a- You're starting from scratch. <laughs> starting from scratch, but, but so much fun. Is, the band is going to be in all, all the whole yeah. series, right? Yeah, each, each band member gets its own book. Yeah. Gets oh, that's book. awesome. Yeah. Okay, and my, my next question is one that I think authors either love or hate because it kind of depends upon your own personal process if you think this way. But if you were going to um, cast a movie based on your book, you know, who would you pick to play the main couple? Do you want to start, Zia? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> Tony is easier to cast because she was very strongly informed by two people. Um, she's, when we first meet her, she's 12 years old in the beginning of the book. And then she's in her mid twenties, um, at, for the most of the book. Um, but Willow Smith, Will, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith's daughter is like this, um, you know, she's, she's, I think she's like 20 or something now, but like, she's been doing her own music for a while. Like, I think her first single came out when she was like 11, whip my hair back and forth. And it was kind of this weird pop rock indie thing that she did and people were like what you know and but she does her own thing she has her own sound she's completely she's like a multi-instrumentalist and the singer and all this stuff and I thought yeah that's like young Tony and then older Tony there's another artist named her um H-E-R who's like starting starting to break through now she was one of Prince's protégés she's a phenomenal guitarist um and she looks she's you know they physically resemble she physically resembles my character so she would be easy to cast. I could put those, you know, we could start the film with, with Willow and, and then like, you know, her take, take the rest of the film. But um, Seb is a di more difficult one because he was informed by some people who are a little old to play him. <laughs> so like, you know, um, like he's like a Chris Cornell, Dave Navarro type guy, like 90s alt rock dude. So I don't even know. I, I need. I would need some reader help to ha to cast him if, if uh, they were asking. Or just but. get the young version of them to time travel. To Something, <laughs> yeah. We need to invent, you know, time travel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Kate, what about you? Who would play your characters? <laughs> uh, I'm well. Okay, so I thought of some on the fly just now because I'm really bad at this kind of thing. <laughs> I, I have said people either hate or love this question. I know it's so hard because I don't I don't generally like cast my books because I have such a specific idea of what they look like what the characters look like in my head but I and then the other thing is that for some reason my brain can only come up with British actors even though it <laughs> takes place in Brooklyn so uh but I think in my head uh the hero my hero Caleb looks kind of like Paul Bettany but like if he were 10 years younger and lived and was from New England. And uh, and the and my heroine Lauren, I think, could be Lily Collins. Uh, maybe with like, but again, probably because they're the characters are Lauren is um in her late 20s, so that's about the right age, I think. Um, yeah, I don't I'm but I'm just coming up with those now. It's so it's so hard to cast. <laughs> It is. It's hard. Farah, what about you? That is, that's a uh, I that's a tricky one because I don't actually visualize my characters when I'm writing them. I um, I come up with their character traits just kind of as I go. It's not something I think through at the beginning. Um, but if I were to pick, so I mean, at one at every at at a certain point in my journey, my editor will ask me like when they're starting to put together the uh, cover. My editor asked me like, who did you picture? I'm like, oh damn it, I didn't picture anyone. <laughs> but I did send her, um, the actress's name is Tia Sirkar, I think, and she's from The Good Place. Um, she played, I'm trying to remember her name, Vicky was from it? The Good Place. Yes, yeah. oh man. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's got a little bit of a spunk to her and she is really, really good at banter at that kind of back and forth, quick uh, uh, dialogue. So I, that's who I would put as, as Rena. Um, and then the hero's a bit tougher because he's supposed to be super, super built. Um, and so probably I would grab a Bollywood actor, um, <laughs> probably. But if I was going to pick somebody, um, also he has to have a British accent. So you could go with Dev Patel if he bulked up a little bit. Um, he definitely has that kind of sparkle and that little uh, playfulness about him that, that uh, Nadim has. So we'll go with those two, I guess. <laughs> And I wanted to ask you guys about your creative journey. Um, 
like how did you like why contemporary romance I guess is what I'm trying to ask um why did you choose this to write and what what about the genre um has drawn you toward it you can start Farah oh uh sure um <laughs> so I I only started writing relatively recently um I started about five years ago um and I had before that I kind of like in the back of my head always wanted to write but never did um so I was like I think it was 39 and I decided you know what enough's enough I'm gonna try I didn't expect to ever be published it was just doing it for fun um and I totally intended to only be a romance writer I jumped in um wanting to write romance and that's it um and then contemporary just kind of made sense I, I felt like at the time and I still kind of feel like that the contemporary is the easiest way to, to start <laughs> even though uh the interesting thing was especially back then I was more of a reader of historical um but I think historical is tricky, especially since for me, it's very important to write um, within my culture. I write South Asian Muslim characters. And I think uh, I can't, I can't, I, I mean, I can't easily put that into a Regency romance. And that's pretty much what I was reading back then. I could maybe, but it wouldn't, it would take a ton of research. And I'm not sure I have the ability to do that sensitively for various reasons. So contemporary just kind of was like, okay, this is a good place to start. And then I kind of fell in love with rom-com as a genre. Um, I love being funny. I love putting the jokes in there and uh, the connections and puns and all that stuff. So I just kind of, I'm happy here, but I'm not saying that I'll never ever do anything else. Um, but right now I'm happy here. Well, clearly you're doing something else because you're doing YA as well. Oh, that's true, yeah, yeah. But it's still a YA romance. Um, maybe yeah. not as funny as my adult stuff, but it's definitely still why it's contemporary spirit. romance. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about you, Kate? Um, I I feel like I sort of stumbled into it. Um, I've been writing for a long time, and when I when I was in my twenties, I did a lot of um, I joined a writers group, and I started like sort of I spent a, a lot many years actually really trying to find my voice and figure out what I was really interested in and the first few things that I wrote were for myself that will probably never ever be published were um contemporary romances and I um and I was reading a lot of contemporary romance at the time and I think that was probably influencing me and like um you know I read like half of Nora Roberts's backlist one year because just I couldn't stop once I got started and then um I um, but I, I love to dabble in different things. So in my backlist, I have a couple of historicals and historical romance is really one of my favorite things to read. So I, um, but I think contemporary, let's, I think you can do some different things in terms of the language that you're using and you can set things in familiar places. And to me, I thought, you know, I've, I lived, I've lived in New York City for almost 20 years and I thought, you know, I want to show New York the way that I experience it. And, um, and I thought that, you know, sort of adding to like a lot of contemporary romance is set in small towns and which is great. Like I'm not nothing knock, knocking small towns. I love Joel Shalvis. I love um, Kristen Higgins. Like there are a lot of authors that I read all the time, but at the same time, like I wanted to show like well, here's how people live in cities that's a little different because it is different. I mean, I don't own a car. <laughs> um, you know, people live in closer quarters. There, people walk more. Um, you know, there, it's a different, it's sort of a different pace and a different way of living. And so I really wanted to show that in fiction. And I think that, um, but I've, but I like that I've gotten to dabble in other things as well and hope to do more of that in the future also. I think that contemporary is something I'll always come back to but every now and then I'm like, but I have this really cool idea <laughs> for this other thing. Like I wrote a book with, um, with ghosts in it. Cause I, you know, I had this idea and I was like, all right, I'm going to write it. And early in my career, I, um, I was publishing through small presses. And so I sort of had, um, and I didn't know what I was doing really. So I was like, I just have this idea, so I'm going to write it. And then that was sort of how things were going. So I've gotten a little bit more strategic over time, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, but I bounce around a lot in, in my head. Most of my books are contemporary, but um, every now and then I'm like, let me write a historical and see what happens. Um, and then rom-com is fairly new to me. Um, I, I've, a lot of my contemporary romances are a little angstier than this book is. This book is a little bit lighter. And um, I mean, I like humor. I like, I love laughing. I'm always 
I like a joke. I put a lot of jokes in my books generally, but this was a little bit more um, lighter conflict, lower stakes, sort of a fun, more escapist read than the stuff I usually write. Not that my books are super angsty, but um, yeah, this was a slightly different direction for me. And Zio, uh, what about you? Um, well, like Farah, I have only been published for about five years, a little over five years. But I think unlike um, anyone here, I never read romance until I accidentally wrote one. And I accidentally wrote one on my Tumblr blog um, over the course of nine months. I was posting like a chapter every other day in this random thing that I started writing and it went sort of viral and I didn't realize it. Um, and 200,000 words later, a friend of mine was like, you've written a, a romance or like romantic fiction here. You should figure out what to do with that. I was on the road touring with my band and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not an author. Um, and coincidentally, this person, I, it was Denny S. Bryce. Um, she and I had met in the Buffy fandom. So I had written fan fiction. I'm, I'm a fandom girl, um, but never thought like, yeah, I wrote that 60,000 word thing, but never thought, oh, I could write a book. Like it just didn't even occur to me. Um, so it was really strange stumbling into publishing anything, <laughs> you know, um, but I wrote uh, my first novella and I thought, okay, let me see what, what I can do with this. And then I had built up this network by that time um, over the course of the year that some people that I met, you know, authors and, and people were like, oh my gosh, Zia wrote a book. Let's all talk about it and read it. And I was like, wait, what is happening? So it was really sort of accidental. And I think because I'm a big like genre fiction person, like I grew up reading Anne Rice and you know, I'm a big Jim Butcher fan and, you know, stuff like that. So like, I, you, you would think if you'd asked me six years ago, if I was going to write a book, I would say it'd be science fiction or fantasy. So contemporary romance was a, quite a surprise to me, but um, I'm comfortable there. You know, I can, I can build a world within a world kind of like what Kate was talking about. Like I live in a massive city, but it's very neighborhoody. And I think people who watch TV shows and films about life in cities, it's like, you know, high rise buildings and da, da, da. they don't get to see that sort of like neighborhoody, you know, you know, the people next door, you know, the corner store guy, like that stuff. So I love building that out, you know, for readers and stuff. But yeah, I love contemporary romance. I think I will eventually write something when I have the discipline to do the kind of world building that it would take to write, you know, paranormal or science fiction or the things that I like to read as well. But yeah, I have to, you know, figure out that discipline first. Okay, and I think it's time to take some questions. It is. I could have just let you all keep going, like the book recommendations you were talking about, and then making me want to go back and watch Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> like, I'm just <laughs> thinking of Dev Patel. Like, I just, I, I love this so much. Thank you all. Um, also, we need your Buffy fanfic, Zia. That's what I'm hearing. Um, mm -hmm. just, uh, yeah. <laughs> So, Careful what you ask for. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but that's okay. Uh, so I, um, I, I have. We have audience questions here. Uh, let me refocus. Uh, we have audience questions here, and so in the chat that uh, you're watching, uh, you're watching the screen. Uh, there's a chat next to it um, that you can type your questions in. So a really fun one to start with is. Um, some of you, you mentioned other uh, romances that you started with, but what are some books that inspired you to become a writer? It doesn't have to be romance, I don't think, but. Like I said, I, I grew up um, reading Anne Rice. Mm -hmm. um, she is a master at, at putting you in a place, making you see and smell and hear and taste it. Um, and, it, you know, she was informing me as an author before I ever dreamed of ever writing even the fanfic you know it was just like well if I were ever going to write a book this is how I want to write a book because it's just so immersive you know it was the point where like in high school I created my own coven like vampire coven we had like our own names and stuff and we used to like stick letters in our locker from like I was like Lydia to something something like you know I was like the sire and stuff so like you know if if an author can inspire a 15 year old girl to do this you know in, the, in between biology and whatever class then like you know I would want to be that person but yeah yeah. So that's your YA book. That's what I'm hearing. So yeah, like yeah, that was totally my YA. Oh, totally, that they like totally. create for themselves and one of them secretly is a vampire. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> um, what, what about for what about for you, Kate? Uh, well, I think it's it's sort of multifaceted because when I was I started um, poking at writing when I was a teenager and at the time like YA was like um, Sweet Valley High and Christopher Pike because it was the 90s um, and 
uh, and I, the very first thing I ever tried to write was like a knockoff Christopher Pike novel that um, is on a floppy disk somewhere in my apartment. Uh, but I, uh, and then um, I took, I, I have a literature degree and I took a seminar on Toni Morrison when I was in college. And um, she's one of my personal writing heroes. Like her books are so beautiful. And the way she writes, particularly her later books are just like just blow me away. And so that she was one of my big inspirations. And then as far as romance goes, um, Nora Roberts was really my gateway drug <laughs> into into rom reading romance and then um and that was like seriously a um well here's i'm going to name drop a little bit so um romance writer alexis daria and i are very old friends and she was the one who handed me a nora roberts novel and said you should read this and um it sort of took off from there like and i just read everything i could get my hands on and then that i think informed a lot of how i approached writing romance when i got started that's wonderful to hear. And I, I love that story of a friend handing you that book. That's that introduction. I had a very similar introduction to romance and um, was a friend like, no, try this. You can do it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you will love it. It was the same for me. And Denny gave yeah. me five, five books or five authors. And she was like, read some of this because we were like a week away from going to this conference together. And I was like, I haven't read romance. She's like, well, here's five completely different. It was J.R. Ward, Robin Covington, Tracy Brogan, and I can't remember the other two. I think I only got through. The, and I was like, okay, That's these are all over the place. Yeah, it was like, it was like, it was nothing like what I thought it was, it was what I was expecting. Yeah. yeah. Farah, what about you? Um, so like I said, I, I kind of got into writing later, um, but probably similar to Kate, I used to be a big daydreamer and I'd have this, like, I, I mean, I was writing just in my head. I wasn't putting it down, but I think similar to Kate, it was all like Christopher Pike and the old uh, Sweet Valleys back in the 90s. Um, as I got a bit older, I got really into 90s chick lit. So like Helen Fielding and Marion Keys, I absolutely, like I would just inhale those. Um, and then eventually I came to romance. But I think when I started writing, it was those 90s chick lit books that I was, that was kind of what inspired me to go to rom-com. I wanted to be, I wanted to write basically Marion Keys books um with south asian muslims and set in the 2000s instead of like in the early 90s um and then i mean for for it was hard for me at first when i decided to start writing i didn't know exactly what i was going to tell was i going to tell my own stories was i going to write people that look like me um because i like i said i knew i wanted to write romance and even even that five years ago there wasn't other south there wasn't south asian romance writers um the south asian writers that i enjoyed were writing lit, lit fic, maybe the odd uh, women's fiction or maybe a mystery, but I didn't know any romances. And then I read my first Sonali Dev book and I was like, oh, you can write romance if you're South Asian. You can write South Asian romance. Talk about a rock star. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, I, I name drop her all the time. She's actually a friend of mine now, which is totally amazing. And she blurbs my books for me. Um, and she's always there when I, when I need guidance, but really it wasn't until I read one of her books that I was like, okay, so this is possible. And I love telling that story because that was only about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And right now we have a, like, I have a, a group that I chat with regularly of, um, 10 South Asian romance writers. So we went from just her to 10 of us that are, and those are just the ones that talk. We, t those are just the ones of us that are friends. They are more than just us. There's, you, there's, there's so many of us. And I think that's just so fantastic and we don't all have to write the same thing we all write very different things and we're all doing our thing um doing our thing in in in, in the marketplace today which is great no that's incredible and that's one of the amazing things that romance can do and has been able to show so many people themselves in romance yeah. in ways that some other stories and genres have not been able to which leads me into my next question we're going to take about two more um and, and terry i'd love your opinion on this next one too but what do you say to people who claim that romance is an invalid genre and is just not as, not yet valid, they say invalid genre, but I think not as good or not as, you know, as belittle, they belittle romance. What do you, what do you say in response to those people? And um, anybody got a direct answer right away? I mean, I give people books. Here <laughs> <laughs> is a really great book. I actually, um, I have a friend who I, I met through a writer's group who um, 
he's like a middle-aged guy who um and he came to me one time and he's like look i'm trying to read outside of the genres i normally read can you recommend something and he has like super like reads a lot of like Jack Reacher novels kind of so I was like okay how can I and I was like I will give him romantic suspense and like I dug up some great romantic suspense novels and was like here you go why don't you read some Suzanne Brockman why don't you read some of these other authors and like and he came back and he was like you were totally right like these books were great and I was like see that's like and there's so much and they're so fun and there's so much good writing and I think that a lot of um like that was sort of my, when I read my, I read the first, that, that Nora Roberts novel that Alexis gave me, I read it on a bus trip. Like I was going to see a friend of mine in Boston and I was on this like four hour bus trip and I read the whole book in one sitting and I was like, oh my God, this was, this was such a great time. Like just sitting here reading this book. Um, and I had sort of forgotten that reading could be like enjoyable on that level. Cause I have a, I have this like snooty English lit degree. So I'd only been writing like reading like important books and those are great too. Like they have their place, but um, but then I was like, oh, that was really fun. I want more of that feeling. So I, you know, that's my that's my way. I'm like, all right, if you don't like, if you don't think romance is valid, I will find you some books that will appeal to you, and you read them, and then come back to me and tell me that it's not a valid genre. Yeah, I all usually right, ask people what they approach? read. Or, or Zio, yes, please. I was gonna say I usually ask people what 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 do you like to read, and they'll say science fiction or fantasy or whatever it is. I'm like, okay, cool. Here, and like Kate said, here's a book from. You know, um, but I, the thing that I always wonder is why, because romance delivers that happily ever after, happily for now, why that's less valid than solving the mystery at the end of a mystery or defeating the bad guys at the end of the science fiction or, you know, like it's all fantasy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like not the good guys don't always win. So like, here we are with this aspirational, hopeful genre. Why are you poo-pooing it? I, I can't put my finger on why people may- Not dismiss it I don't know <laughs> don't know why yeah it's such a, and it's strange coming from women especially you know over people who identify yeah you know it's just like um it's just it just drives me crazy so, so yeah I I recommend books um not always not even ever my own I just say well here's something oh, and I will say you know I didn't read romance either until I read it and then I fell in love with it you know, because they assume that you start reading romance when you're 12 years old and you were stealing your mom's books or whatever. And I'm like, no, I felt I came late to it. I wish I had been reading all those years because there's thousands of books that I'll probably never get to, you know, because there's so many, so much, so much out there. The great but, tragedy um, of our lives. Right, right. <laughs> Too many books, no time. Yeah. But yeah. Harry Farah, do you follow a same, a similar path when, when people you're confronted with that um, prejudice? Yeah, I I totally just say, have you read any? And mm -hmm. that usually the answer is no, or I don't like, they assume it's smut, or they assume it's something it's not. Um, I think the the misconception is that it's all the same, mm -hmm. um, that the tropes are all the same, and the, the, formula. the formula is the same, and mm -hmm. they're all, it's like, oh, do you know how big this industry is? Like, it's massive. Everybody's writing something different. Um, so yeah, my, my answer is usually around the same, pretty much the same as what Zio and Kate said. And so what the formula thing gets me because it's like, mystery is a formula. Thrillers exactly. are a formula. It's all a yes. formula. It's so- There's yeah. the hero's journey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hero's journey. Aristotle created the freaking <laughs> hero. Like, formula. still use that. <laughs> right. And, and I think one of the great things about romance is like the only, the only, the, literally the only requirement is the happy ending. You can do anything you want to get to that point and some writer probably has because mm -hmm. there's so much variety in the genre yeah yeah Mary, what what can you add to this what what other secrets can you give us how to how to convert people into romance readers um well you guys are a lot nicer about it than i am <laughs> <laughs> Well, tell us how to, tell us how to be nice. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, well, there's two there's two big things that I always say. And first of all, you know, romance sells more than all the other genres combined. So just from a business standpoint, it's the most successful genre out there. And that alone, you know, especially, you know, in a culture like America, um, you know, kind of demands that everyone should be taking it more seriously than they are. Um, because in the marketplace, you know, it's viability. But also, you know, I, it deals with love and wanting to be loved and wanting to love someone in return. And that is a universal feeling. I mean, I think that every human alive, you know, that's, that's a deep 
that's a deep thing that we all want. And it, I think that's why it is the best selling genre, because I think that it really, um, you know, touches that place inside and, and taps into that deep need that we all have to feel that way. And again, that's, that's a really important universal human experience. So why, do, you know, why would that be silly in any way? That's, that's what I always say. No, I like it. We need a little bit of spice to our answers too. Absolutely. Well, here at Tired Cover, we like to end our live streams by asking this question. And and Terry, I want you to chime in as well as a reader. I apologize in advance though, because you've got three books to pick from. So, um, but what did your book for you authors and Terry, one or all three of these books teach you as a writer, as a person, what did this book teach you? Hmm. That's and while our question. authors think, Terry, do you have something? I know I'm, I'm putting you on the you were going to pick me. First. I have the Jeopardy theme running in my head now. <laughs> <laughs> like, all I can say really is that Kate's book made me believe that I could actually move to Brooklyn and start a cat cafe. <laughs> there you go. That works. Yeah, like that would be a dream come true. So <laughs> I like that. Terry, Terry realized her lifelong dream. That's been yes. perfect. <laughs> This is actually the first time I've ever written animals. And my, my editor actually was recommending me. She, like, she actually called me one day and she's like, okay, I need you to read these books. And she, she sent me a list. And so I read them all um, that like romance novels that have like animal characters in them. Cause I was like, I mean, and I'm, I'm a cat person. Um, I've had cats my whole life. Uh, my dad has a dog now, but you know. You can <laughs> forget that. Him. Uh, it's a very cute dog, so it's fine. Uh, but but they uh, but I I had never written animals before, and so I had to really think about like because the thing with with animals is I think they bring a certain amount of chaos, and that's sort of where um, some of the fun is. Like in in and that's sort of where a lot of the books that I was recommended that I was reading have these these animal characters that like come in and create a mess and create chaos, and then so I had to think about like how do you write animals? Like, it's such a weird thing to think about, but I really had never written an animal before. I'd never put one in a book. So That's that was great. amazing. That's yeah. awesome. Way to grow as a writer. <laughs> Laura, what about you? I think this book taught me that my weird wackadoo ideas can actually pay off. Um, like I said, writing a book that's mostly about bread. Um, <laughs> uh, combining a like, again, this was just like a, a whack, a, a crazy idea of having an arranged marriage and a fake engagement happening at the same time. Um, I was like, that's a, that's not going to work. And I learned that, yeah, it could work. Um, it just takes a little bit of finagling. Um, but I, I mean, I, I had a lot of fun writing it. And I think that was the thing that I learned the most is that I can write just a fun, happy, joyful story with, um, with people of color with people that are struggling to kind of be seen in the world. Um, it doesn't have to be torturous. It doesn't have to be painful. Um, and I think that is something that I really, that, that's something that I really enjoyed and that I learned out of this book. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think this book taught me a couple, well, it's, I call it wish fulfillment a little bit, this book, because it taught me that there's more than one way to achieve your dream or your wish. Um, my character, Tony, has this dream of becoming a successful musician one way and it happens another way um, in a way that she hadn't foreseen. As a songwriter, my whole thing is about touching people with my stories, which I did to some limited success as a songwriter, but with this book, I'm reaching more people and touching more people. So it's sort of like a rock and roll fairy tale. We'll come back around to that first question um, for me and for the character. So that's what I learned that there's more more than one way to get that happy ending. This has been wonderful. And I know I'm not the only one who's enjoyed it. Thank you all for your candor, for your kindness, for your uh, stories. Honestly, like, thank you for this, this work that you do and these gifts that you give us. And Terry, thank you for leading that wonderful discussion. Thank you for taking the charge. I, I appreciate you all so much in taking this time tonight. I do want to go around and do a round robin reminding everybody who you are, where they can find you online and anything else that you want to say before we close out tonight. And Terry, I am going to call on you one more time so that we can feature <laughs> our, our authors of the hour here, these panelists, but Terry, please take it away. Tell us who you are and anything else you want to mention. 
Okay, I'm Terry Wilson. I write um, romance and romantic comedy. And you can find me at terrywilson.net. That's T E R I W I L S O N.net. And I have a 101 Dalmatians inspired rom com coming from Source Books in September called A Spot of Trouble. What? Yeah. Okay, we're having you back. We would be okay. for your event. <laughs> Such a great title. That's brilliant. Oh mm. my gosh, so exciting. Well, y'all can pre order that. Uh, <laughs> tattercover.com um, and in no other order except alphabetical Zio if you could go next please I'm Zio Axelrod um, I have a book The Girl with Stars in Her Eyes it's the first in this four book series about the lilies you can follow me at Zio Axelrod X-I-O-A-X-E-L-R-O-D on Instagram Facebook Twitter if you're really brave you can follow my Tumblr X-I-O-N-I-N which is where I do all my fandom stuff. Um, and it's also on AO3 if you're looking for my fanfic. Um, and, um, and if you wanna follow the band and me, cause I'm singing, um, it's The Lilies Rock, um, A at The Lilies Rock and it's L-I-L-L-Y-S Rock on Instagram and uh, Spotify and all that stuff. So yeah, I'm a Talk social media butterfly. Interactive reading experience, love it. <laughs> yeah. Farah. Uh, yeah, so I'm Farah Heron. I'm on, uh, my website is Farahheron, uh, com, F-A-R-A-H-H-E-R-O-N. I'm on Instagram, Farahheron author. I'm on Twitter, Farahheron. Um, so my latest release is Accidentally Engaged. Uh, and then my next release is the YA that I kind of briefly mentioned is called Tahira in Bloom. Um, it'll be out in November. So it's a uh, teen romance about a floral, sorry, a fashion designer and a guy that's obsessed with plants and they learn about floral design all summer. So and I'm, I'm really calling looking you for our teen con. That's what I'm thinking there. That's <laughs> it's awesome. About, it's about it's fashion, uh, fashion flowers all set in a very, in a fictional small town um, in Ontario. So I'm really excited for that. That'll be out in November. Damn you all for making my reading list longer. Okay, and Kate? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Kate McMurray. You can find me online at, at katemcmurray.com. Uh, spelled pretty phonetically. Uh, from my website, you can find all my social media because my handle is a little different at every service because Kate is too common a name. Uh, <laughs> and there's a there's a college student in Massachusetts who got there first in some cases. Uh, so uh, yeah, so Like Cats and Dogs is my new book that came out last week that's set at a cat cafe in Brooklyn. Book two comes out in December, I think, and it's called Look What the Cat Dragged In. We, we just changed the title like two weeks ago. So uh, that's, that's, that's pretty exciting. So that'll be um, with the events manager at the cafe. And, uh, and then the heroine from the first book, the hero is her brother. Okay. So it's, it's all connected. So all the characters come back in and have cameos and there's, that'll be a lot of fun. And there's, there's definitely more cats. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually also working on a series that is, um, it's a gay romance series that is set in a fictional version of HGTV. So if you are, if you are a, an HGTV fan, I, that is my like number one, like sound wallpaper in the background most of the time. So uh, if you like a home renovation show, the first book in that series came out in March time isn't I don't know what time is anymore right no, um, no it's, it's been March for a year <laughs> it's called domestic do-over and um is available in the world places so um yeah this has been utterly delightful thank you all so much for this and I'm McKaylee with Tatter Cover Bookstore I want to thank these wonderful authors once again and you can get all of their books and pre-order the other ones coming up at tatteredcover.com we just thank you all so much for supporting local independent bookstores we wouldn't be here without you. We wouldn't be able to have amazing authors like the ones that we have here tonight without you. So we thank you all once again. If you all will stick around while I just finish closing us out. Uh, this has been our contemporary romance panel. We encourage you to read romance, share romance. So stay safe, everybody, and happy reading. Thanks, all. <laughs>